Good morning. Yes, yes. I, I'm feeling so, so excited by this conference. Yesterday was just amazing. You know, I couldn't sleep last night. I was, my mind was racing with all kinds of future projects and collaborations and challenges, opportunities, thinking of Brazil, India, Haiti, and today we're in Africa. And, and I'm, I, I'm honored. So I want to thank the organizers, Ken Manning, um, Samantha, Tracy, for including me in this amazing, amazing conference. So, and, and I'm very moved because Haiti is Africa in the Caribbean. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I feel so proud and privileged to be introducing these four African luminaries. And, uh, and I'm going to start with um, Professor Chakanitsa Mavunga, who's a full professor in the program in science technology, and society at MIT. His latest book is titled, and I love this title because it speaks to me personally, Dare to Invent the Future, Knowledge in the Service of and Through Problem Solving. I just cannot wait for this book to appear in 2023 in the MIT uh, Press book series on Global South Cosmologies and Epistemologies. Professor Chakanetsa is the series editor. His professional interests lie in the history, theory, and practice of science, technology, innovation, and entrepreneurship in the international context with a focus on Africa. Jakanitsa, and I'm very privileged to say that, um, joined MIT as a tenure track assistant professor in, in 08 after completing his PhD in Michigan, University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, where I used to teach a long time ago in 1993 before you were born, Chakaritza. <laughs> He's the author of two books, both with MIT Press, The Mobile Workshop, The Tsetse Fly, and African Knowledge Production in 2018, and then Transient Workspaces, Technologies of Everyday Innovation in Zimbabwe in 2014. Chakaritza is also the editor of What Do Science, Technology, and Innovation Mean from Africa? Chakaritza is currently editing a second volume Everyday Design Maker X, from the margins to the center. This volume positions everyday life as a design maker experience with strong implications for design practice. And Chikanitsa is also the founder and convener of the Global South Cosmologies and Epistemologies Initiative, which offers an annual graduate super seminar co-taught across the world by a distinguished cast of Global South theoreticians, and design makers. I mean, just, just amazing. So that's Chakanitsa. And then we're going to hear from Ekene Mekunye, who's a filmmaker. And I had the pleasure to sit next to Ekene yesterday at dinner, and it was just uh, extremely inspiring. And, and I cannot wait for the weekend to watch his films on Netflix. Um, so Ekene also works in TV production and in photography. His films have gotten five nominations at the most prestigious African uh, festival, the Africa Magic Viewer's Choice 2022, including Best Director. He's done five feature films. Three of them have been released. Sylvia in 2018, Light in the Dark in 2019, One Lagos Night in 2021. All these feature films have made it to number one on Netflix in Nigeria and have been screened at Nollywood, um, no Nollywood Week in Paris and as at other international film festivals in all the continents of the world, including the British Film Institute and the Durban International Film Institute. Ekene has also produced short films like Las Guy Device, 2017, Encounter, 2015, and Oblivious, 2014. <laughs> Extremely prolific. Some of his films have won Africa's biggest film awards, as I mentioned before. So Ekene worked for Mnet from 2011 to 2013, then for MTV in 2013, then he started his own com company called Riverside Productions. He also runs a free training program called the Imagery Program that teaches young people the art of screenwriting, acting, and filmmaking from the best filmmakers in Africa. Ekenia studied filmmaking at New York Film Academy and at Universal Studios in Los Angeles. And he also has a degree in insurance <laughs> from the University of Lagos and is part of the executive MBA program at the Lagos Business School and is adjunct faculty member at the School of Media and Communication, Penn Atlantic University. So, it's, so th those African scholars are 
Renaissance people. I mean, it's amazing the, the amount of different things that they do. Um, and now we're going to move to Rus Russell Kwangwane. So I, I've been practicing this. <laughs> How am I doing, Russell? <laughs> so Russell is a cultural producer and a consultant for creative industries. He's based in Durban, South Africa. His work obsesses over the tensions in heritage, modernity, culture, and tradition as they apply to black life. His practice includes research, cultural production, design theory, writing, film, and curatorship. He's part of a number of working groups spread all across um, the Southern African region, the African continent, and more broadly, the world. He's shown his work all in South Africa, Europe, Argentina, and the United Arab Emirates, and Japan. Now, the best for last. <laughs> Jeb Chumba, Jeb Chumba. Jeb Chumba is a digital cultural ambassador. She's the founder and creative director of African Digital Art, a collective and creative space where digital artists, enthusiasts, and professionals can seek inspiration, showcase the artistry, and connect with emerging artists. Jeb Chumba is dedicated to promoting the growth of the creative technology in Africa. Originally from Kenya, she has lived, traveled, and spoken around the world, promoting a commitment to, to a culture of technology in Africa. As an artist, African digital artist, she's passionate about creating unique digital exp experiences that showcase Africa's legacy of technology. And Jeb Tumba has been listed by Forbes as one of the 20 youngest power women in Africa, and in The Guardian Africa as one of the top 25 women achievers. So we're extremely, extremely privileged to have this amazing cast of African innovators and activists um, in our midst today. So I cannot wait to um, listen to you all. So. Sorry, I can't put this down in part because I just received it from Ekene as a gift. <laughs> and also because it's too precious to put down in case it takes it back, so I'll put it here. <laughs> Should be all set. I'll put you up on the screen. Okay. Now, I think this is the t last time you are seeing the title. Um, I think it's gone. Um, to be replaced by a, soon to be replaced by a blank slate, <laughs> also very deliberate because when we met for the first time with my three guests and friends, we were going to talk about um, videography between freedom and oppression we decided that we don't want to talk about oppression um, because it forces us to have to respond to the past. We instead want to chart the future, conscious of the role of history um, in three main ways, three or four main ways. One is that it provokes and evokes, hence pro-evoke. Uh, secondly, the work of history is to act as a tool for researching ourselves. And by researching, it means that which has been lost or erased. Thirdly, it is a work of remembering ourselves, which is not just storytelling, but storytelling plus. Or if you prefer, plus storytelling. That plus is critical because it gestures towards several other things that are happening um, in lieu of storytelling. And that frame devices we use, not just use, deploy, but make. Fourth, 
It's a work of speculating. That's what history enables us to do, uh, to engage in this work of asking, what if what did not happen had happened? And what if what happened had not happened? Now, I was trained as a very good historian, whatever that meant, in back when I was at the University of Zimbabwe and then at the University of Michigan. It is not the work of historians to, speculate, to, to, to engage in speculation. But what if that kind of historical writing is not for everybody? What if some of us need to engage in speculation as a prelude to a final move? which is speculative design making. I know design making precisely because design is not writ large. We have to, it doesn't come to us well explained and well understood a priori. Because we were not available for historical reasons when this language was formulated. Now that we are there, it affords us an opportunity to have to offer our somewhat belated input. In other words, making what did not happen, happen. And making what happened not happen in the future. Now, this presentation will be divided into four parts. After this, I'll be quiet and just let the images provoke and evoke. The second part of it, and third and fourth, will focus on how we can use history as something that is not in the distant past, but lives with us every day, which some of us cannot escape. Sometimes it imprisons, we prefer, we much rather prefer that it acts as a tool for our self-rehumanization and self-reintellection and the assembling of our own resources to live respectable lives. Hence, what we want to talk about first is to look at images of Africa and engage in an assembling of archives and vocabularies for storytelling our creative everyday. And with that, I will now shut my mouth and let the visual uh, come to you.
Thank you. I will now invite uh, Ekene Mwekunye to take us to the next phase of this uh, presentation on color bashing. Good morning, everyone. It's such a great pleasure and honor to be here today. Um, so I'll be very brief with this. Before I go into color bashing, well, most Everything I'm going to talk about today have been inspired from talks with Professor Mavunga here, and um, I'm very excited to talk about these things. Um, so we talk about being witness, you know, and we talk about videography. Um, but I have a question. So how have we been being witness before? We had these little devices that have cameras in our, you know, so are we trying to say that um, we were not being witness? Are we saying we were not fighting for justice? So, you know, I'm a filmmaker and I cannot be a filmmaker without the camera. So I understand the power of the camera. In fact, I have a job because of the camera, <laughs> you know, but what I'm trying to say in essence is that the camera in itself is not what is doing the work because something has to happen for the camera to be effective. So to a large extent, it's as though we've put so much importance on that tool and forgetting that the camera in itself is useless if there's nothing in front of it. So there's so much work going on in that aspect that we are not looking at. And it's something I thought to talk about. But that's just on the side. So I'm going to talk about color bashing. Color bash to Africans, color bash is very, very important. Uh, we use it for a lot of things. Um, if you drink palm wine, for instance, we don't serve it in cups like this. For some reason, it doesn't taste sweet when you use cups like this. When you drink it with the calabash, it comes with a different taste, trust me. You know, and, and um, it serves as a music instrument, it serves as a, um, as a jar, you know, to, to, um, to keep liquids and preserve them, and a whole lot of other things. So let me explain, I mean, just for those that don't know what a calabash is. So um, it, it comes from a, um, a plant that produces something like this. This is what it looks like on the tree, right? And by the time it process comes to something like this. So you open the top and you can also use it as a music instrument as well, you know? And okay, um, this is kind of slightly distorted, but before this, sorry. Oh. Okay, I think there's something missing. Okay, but it's fine. So we also have some that come in a round shape and it's, at the end of it, it gets something like, so you see something like this? So we often use this to um, carry palm oil and um, it's, a palm oil is usually served in something like this. But before I go further, yes. So you can also design it to something like this. Okay, so why am I talking about the calabash? So we're talking about videography. You know, it's interesting that in Africa, so the camera was invented um, in the late 18th century, yeah, about. Um, but in Africa, we have been, in a way, using the camera for centuries. Well, not like the kind of cameras you have today. So those days, um, see the color bash like this. So we have the, um, well, you call them juju priests, we call them, like, the Yorubas call them Babalawo, the Ifa priests. Um, from where I come from, um, I'm Igbo, so we call them Dibia. So they carry the calabash, right, and they put liquid in it, like water, but not exactly water. So those days, if we needed to see what happened at certain times, so I'll give you an instance. So let's say someone steals something and they don't know who stole it and they needed to find out who stole it. So they'll go meet the Dibia 
and he will bring out his calabash. And they put the liquid, and he makes some incantations. And before you know it, it's playing you the video live in HD. <laughs> so I'm not too sure if it would, if we could do like 3D, you know, but at least I was sure of HD. You know, and it's interesting because that was how they viewed things then. You know, and it could rewind and it could fast forward. <laughs> you know, and these were things that they were doing centuries ago. You know, so, um, you know, um, my prof was saying speculative. So I'm asking myself, I mean, these guys, I mean, a lot of you are so chilled by virtual reality now. I mean, these guys were playing with virtual reality then. So question for me is, why didn't we in Africa look for a way to develop this technology so that we could export it to America and Europe? I wish I had the answer to that question. Well, but just so you know that, I mean, we've been playing with these things that you guys are fascinated about now, we've been playing with these things in Africa for centuries. And lastly, um, you know, there's something Barack Obama said that um, Africa does not need strong men, it needs strong institutions. Unfortunately, um, yes, I, I, it seems like we have more of strong men and strong institutions because the good thing about the video and what it does is that it gives us an opportunity to um, gives us an opportunity to document some of these incidences that happen. I'm looking at like the George Floyd case and the likes, but what happens where the institutions don't do their work? So even though you have all the witnesses and you have everything, it's still useless. So it's something that I crave for, um, for the continent. And, and I know it's not just the continent because even in places like here, I mean, there are, I know there are certain places you could bring out your camera and you could get shot and nothing will happen. You know, so um, it, it can't work by itself. It also needs things like that to be able to be effective. Thank you for your time. What Ekene didn't show you was oh. this. I think this is what he was looking for. Yes, that's how you found out who had stolen something. You will make him look into the water or make a look into the water and then you could see things that happened yesterday or that will happen or that are happening now. Um, the calabash is also a very strong instrument for the electronic and the sound that we see in video. And so to that extent, it is also part and parcel of a question we are asking. What would it take to create the next generation uh, audiovisual capturing devices out of, say, the calabash. My next guest uh, will begin to speculate on some of this through some of the work he's doing uh, in film. Thanks, Prof. Good morning to you all. Thanks for, for being with us um, on a Friday morning. Um, so I'll, I'll, get, I'll get right into it. Um, so I'm kind of sharing these images as a way for us to start a conversation, as a way to kind of play with some ideas and to be in conversation with my colleagues um, in front here, um, but, but also um, with you all. I think this part, part, of, part of the work um, or at least part of the ideas that I'm, that I'm kind of throwing out here, is to one, think of how we situate the camera um, on the continent that we call and know 
as Africa and see what kind of discourse, what kind of theory starts to emerge when we don't rely um, on the vocabulary and the methods and uses of this tool in, in the so-called West um, or North. So I, I should start by saying I'm one of three um, collaborators that are currently developing a project that has kind of convened um, and, and brought us here. Um, Prof here has kind of been a very strong inspiration um, in the making of that work. And so my collaborators, as you see on screen, um, is Amy Wilson as well as Francois Nota, who are based down in Cape Town. Um, so let me start here. So the camera arrives in Africa with anthropologists. The device is what introduces the native to the world. A few centuries later, of course, introduces the, nat the native in a very particular um, and peculiar way. Um, some centuries later, the natives have charge and control over the camera. So they start to refashion and represent themselves in a very particular way. Yeah. The question does remain, how do we conjure, how do we make up, how do we build the stuff that we would have wanted to document? Yeah? So what sits in place of the things that happened, and because there's not the evidence, there's not the documents, they are dismissed as mere myth. And these myths form the backbone and the foundation of our cosmology. Yeah? And so part of the work that we are trying to do with filmmaking is start to present, is start to speculate, is start to build the world that we've heard of through myth. And centuries later, we see it through science fiction, speculative fiction, and so on and so forth. And so uh, uh, much of, of, of the images that you will encounter are trying to bring some kind of visual quality, some visuality to a myth some visuality to a productive possibility that we are trying to build um, and, and work from. So language, language um, begins to, to serve as a repository, as a place of reference for us to excavate um, and pull up some ideas and imaginations around our past. Um, of course, these myths are articulated in this. And I'll just use one example as a way to open up this conversation, or expand the conversation. So, in Isizulu, Ugotwebula is to, is to capture, is to hold something. But Ugotwebula, when you talk about it in a kind of mystic or transcendental dimension, it is to capture one's soul. Yeah? It's a way of kind of keeping diluting, if not diffusing, time, right? And when the camera in, comes to the continent and the camera becomes umtwebuli, the camera person is someone who's able to capture your soul. Uh, to capture, so to take a photograph is umtwebuli. Umtwebuli is the camera person. So this idea that the camera or the camera person is umtwebuli or was umtwebuli, so the capturer, who can capture not just a photograph or what becomes a photograph, they are playing at another dimension, a dimension that we cannot quite understand. So quite literally, if I have a picture of you, I can do some things, right? But that's not the point. Yeah? The point is, what else is operational here? What is this other thing that makes this imagine that kind of mobilizes and brings fuel to this imagination? And that's the kind of work that I think it begins to, uh, begins to open up the possibilities um, and allows us to build a theory around these tools, around a set of technologies um, and devices that have played such a critical role um, in oppressing as well um, for us now in, in, in liberating ourselves through, through storytelling. The speculative um, is a method that I, that I deploy quite strongly in my practice. Why? Because it doesn't, it doesn't depend on, on evidence. It does not depend, <clears throat> excuse me. It, does not, it does not depend on the truth. Yeah? It's a gesture at or towards something. And so these gestures become really, really interesting ways to say, if we can all agree that we did this, Right. Who's to say we didn't do this? If Mapungubwe 
in southern Africa um, is the site where they found the oldest gold smelted um, rhinosaurus, right? And this is facts, yeah? Who's to say we didn't do these other things that we want to speculate upon and speculate about, yeah? And so these images allow us to start communicating with the younger generation, yeah? Kind of putting together some kind of, um, of, of, of visual um, documentation. So these images um, are part of a film that we're currently working on that's called Tata, uh, the Institute for um, Technological Consciousness. Um, and it relies severely or heavily on images that we cannot find out there. And so what we are doing through this work is starting to produce those images and make those images, yeah? Um, and they become really, really important because they're not available. Yeah. So in a way, our making, our future making, our future, our future building um, is, is in production in, in that way, if, if you will. And part of it is also trying to like, bring images that even we as Africans are not familiar to or familiar with. Yeah. This is made um, through the, uh, the DALI um, program that I think one of the speakers last night, uh, yesterday, um, had shown some images from which. Um, I'm towards the end of my, of my sharing. We'll come back and kind of open up a conversation around these images, so mind not. Um, lastly, this is uh, this is the Tete Fly, and so part of part of the work um, in this film is is working uh, is taking inspiration from Prof uh, Mavunga's work and um, starting to to take what was dismissed as myth and build it into a kind of uh, a, um, a a a a filmic world, but also to take it out of a filmic world, um, world and kind of start to make objects and artifacts um, really as a way to p kind of put technology in the hands of young people, you know, amongst, amongst other things and other people. So this is a Tete Fly. Um, maybe Prof can, can speak to this if, if he wishes. Um, but it's a sculpture that um, Francois, who was my collaborator, had made. Um, it features in the film um, and as well it features in, in the book of Prof Mavunga. So you almost start to see how we're starting to build a universe you know, um, from, from myth, really, yeah? Um, but this myth is something we want to work with, yeah? This myth is our speculative, and the world is only created and manufactured through speculating, through playing, and, innovate, and that's where um, innovation becomes possible. And then lastly, um, as part of thinking um, of the relationship um, between the continent and the camera, more recently, or at least in, 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 in the, yeah, more recently there's been a phenomenon where the camera has been kind of quite pervasive and, and it, it enters in all spaces and all circles. Um, but there's also a time when I was much younger um, where the camera could not enter certain rooms, it was not invited at certain events, certain moments, yeah? And again, what, what is at play there? Why, why is it important that the camera has a set of boundaries in places and spaces and moments where it is not invited, yeah? And so what theory could emerge around that, yeah? Um, again, that's a simple, that's a simple question, um, and one could respond in a very simple question, but there's something else that we're trying to kind of tease out um, and, and build there. So that's the end of my presentation for now, and then I'll hand over back to you, uh, Prof. Hello, hi everybody. Um, it is quite surreal for me to be here because um, I'm actually quite a nerdy tech person and have never belonged in any space. Um, so I constantly have to create spaces. So I'm sort of an anomaly, like I'm a very technological person, minded person. Like I gravitated towards that um, as a young child. But then I'm also like sort of artistic and philosophical about things. I'm too much aware of things. 
So I think I've always sort of bounced around between very many different interests, and I realize that I'm very much a product of my time. So my name is Chip Chumba. I'm originally from Kenya, and I'm an African digital artist. And um, when I was sort of trying to assemble my education, my parents thought it was wise to put me to an, uh, into an American missionary school in the middle of Kenya um, that was part of the colonial project. So pretty much my high school um, time that I was in high school, I was always constantly annoying my teachers because they would say, we're gonna study world history. We're starting in Germany, World War I. I'm like, where are we? <laughs> we're in Kenya, what are we doing? Why are we studying this? This is pretty, I was basically set up to constantly ask the question why. Um, and in, in, in a strange way, um, technology, like immersing myself in technology, put myself in spaces in which I could create things that really didn't possibly exist before or like have conversations that moved forward. Um, so one of the things that I did was start something called African Digital Art in 2009 as a way to archive creative projects all from um, all parts of the continent. And the first question that I would receive from people online would be, are you sure this is African? I thought there's no electricity in Africa. Um, uh, what, what is that? Um, so I, I was kind of surprised that those questions came from both like people outside of Africa, but mostly Africans themselves. And I realized that we really had not had many conversations around creative technology. So I sort of made it a point to myself to be sort of out there and have these conversations of like, what would it look like if African artists and philosophers and thinkers and magicians and theorists had this internet space to like theorize and like create new possibilities. And sort of the response to that was like, but we need to solve Africa's problems, like, first, before we start dreaming. Like, there's too many, we can't even sleep <laughs> as Africans. We have to fix the continent. So I think in response to that, a lot of the work that I did went into speculative thinking and dreaming. And then I was called an Afrofuturist, which is really confusing because I feel futurism has a completely separate history in America than it did from where I come from, where I was actually much more into like African, thinking about African futures. So a lot of the activities that I did was in to participate in projects where it would sort of propel a group of people into thinking about the future. And somehow, um, I went sort of all different directions, um, curating projects that um, really invited different artists to think and dream about um, themselves in, in, in Africa. And, and inevitably, I ended up back, right back here to these images that the professor evoked here. Um, can I? How do I? Yeah. Um, as the more I tried to propel myself into the future, I ended up going back into images like this and looking at them in a completely unique and different ways where I, I was allowed to now sort of continue the conversation about the technologies in which um, my ancestors lived, and I was sort of privileged by the fact that I had, by design of my parents and grandparents, always a connection back to where I lived. So I could literally transport myself back and live completely the similar way that my great-grandmother, I lived in her house, like my great-grandmother's homeland, and basically adopt a daily life like that by becoming a farmer. And then I found that this was such a unique space for us to understand the legacy um, of technologies that have been de developed 
on the continent that are much needed now in the time that we live in, as we find it increasingly harder to become human because of the amount of technologies that we continue to adopt. We constantly have this push and pull between like trying to make things different, but then always pulling us back to our tendencies. Um, so I think I'll stop from there um, and invite perhaps a new set of eyes and new set of ears to the conversation that we're having because much of what we're trying to do is to move past like our, our, our tendency of like how we talk about technology on the continent and um, really try to play much more about like possibilities of the future. Yes, and now questions, comments. Yes. Um, hi, my name is Karen Ritzenhoff. Um, I teach at a, at a state university, but I was very fortunate that uh, a colleague of mine who is a sociologist um, allowed me to co-edit a book on Afrofuturism in Black Panther with her. And we got a lot of contributors from a lot of different disciplines, um, from the United States and uh, um, international authors to write about the Afrofuturism in Wakanda and this blockbuster success of Ryan Coogler's um, superhero film. And so since you are filmmakers um, on the panel, um, I wanted to ask if you could explain how Afrofuturism is different, as you just mentioned, um, for you when it's conceived in this kind of blockbuster format and uh, what you think the film did or didn't do for a global audience. Did it, in your um, perception, um, offer opportunities for um, discussions or um, how do you see the influence of this franchise that is soon going to be followed by Wakanda Forever, but also triggered a film like The Woman King with Regina King? Yeah. Oh, I did that. I opened that can of beans. Yeah, you did. <laughs> uh, my first response to the film, I think, is that I think that some of us have completely different imaginations than what we're offered by Hollywood. Um, and yes, it is great that that kind of imagination is accessible, but it's certainly not new. And the term Afrofuturism and African futures is a completely different thing. Um, uh, I would invite us to really think about the we would have if we had an unreliable accounting of the past and how that would affect our dreaming of the future. If you knew that everything that you sort of understood about yourself and who you were, the way in which the world worked and operated was a bunch of stories that could be changed at any time, like how you yourself living in this digital, this mediated digital life that we find ourselves currently, how would you approach the way you're living every day? Um, I think that's like a much better offering than what sort of Hollywood is doing, which, um, yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I think Chip Chumba has responded to that really beautifully. I've got nothing substantial to add. Um, I have a question. Yes. So I, I was thinking about the reimagining and right and and the stories that are told and not told and wondering what your thoughts on and reimagining education um, using videography, 
um, images and you know what you started with in terms of grass and 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 the calabash. You know those things in in American education are not even talked about. Uh, thanks, Tracy. So, I the book Daring to Invent the Future. The subtitle is called Knowledge in the Service of and Through Problem Solving. The reason being, my major claim is that, at least focused on Africa, I'm saying that we are producing useless knowledge. Um, and if it was useful, what is there to show for it? Uh, it's too theoretical. It has not left the kinds of purposes for which the colonizer uh, designed it for, those that dispense it are a part and parcel of the problem of an undecolonized mind. What is essential, therefore, is to engage in a new kind of knowledge of mind re-engineering after amnesia as Ganesh Devi would say. What, is, what happened is that our knowledge systems were stripped of any essence, were caricatured, and we were pointed towards a knowledge system that is Western and white as the only bridge into modernity we may reject that claim because it then foreclosed the possibility of us seeing anything worthwhile to go back into our past. The other thing that happened is that the methods of researching the past were all about research, not researching the past in order to re member what was dismembered. Part of what was dismembered and foreclosed was if, for example, something was designated as witchcraft, what was emphasized was the witch. What was not talked about was the craft. Some of us may want to now go back to that question and say, what was the craft? And if we did that, we will not just end with speculation. The challenge is to say what after speculation. Because we leave our art on the verge, having discovered this certify object, somebody somewhere in Silicon Valley takes it and develops into uh, the next generation technology based on our imaginations. And yet we would be told that this is just a work of fiction, useless fiction. So it's a knowledge for us. It's no longer a knowledge for the sake of writing and publishing books. Books are wonderful but people do not eat the ideas in our heads. We, some of us, have a responsibility to our communities which cannot be fulfilled ever by publishing. That would be my response to you. Hi, my name is Brianna. I'm a comparative media studies and writing lecturer here at MIT. And I have a question in response to something that Russell said, but I'm sure any of you could answer. And so when we're talking about reimagining and re-researching and redesigning realities, it was mentioned that we didn't want to use the same methods of the, of the West. And a good example was not requiring evidence to come to consensus and truth. And I'm wondering if, if you also are thinking about measurements outside of Western measurements that would define the success of those truths. So you mentioned just now publishing or exporting was mentioned earlier. If those aren't the metrics for success, what might be? 
I'll, I'll, I'll answer this very quickly, then pass it on to Russell. I think for me, the question, my legacy will be how much lives have I touched? Uh, because for as long as I go back to my village and I find people still walk, uh, children still walk five miles to school and five miles back, the same ones that I, I, I walked. And I see kids in South Framingham continuing to go hungry and can't find after school programs uh, that keep them at school doing something worthwhile. Um, and they go on the streets and they do things that, you know, create this cycle over and over again. I don't think, in my view, I should brag about being a fully tenured, full professor. That's a very hollow victory. Um, my, my measurement, perhaps, of success is to have constructed some kind of intergenerational discourse, would say, between my son and my grandmother. Um, and, and the work that I'm doing is translating um, ideas and imagination that were contained within my grandmother. So maybe if I give you a very practical example. Um, through this work, we, we host workshops um, and we kind of play with this idea of objects of power. So if, uh, so if like African masks, for, exa for example, are objects that are, that are potent, um, so we kind of invite young people, we present images to young people and we fill the room with the waste. Yeah? And it's okay, let's, let's play, like look at this image, look at this image. And they start like asking questions, what's this? And how does this stuff come together? And it starts to kind of, you know, it, it, it helps them make, it helps them construct, but it also helps them ask questions about the world. Um, and a really important one is that they are using as a reference our grandmothers and our ancestors, folklore, and, and, and so on. And so if one can start to bridge that gap, I think we would be kind of starting to move the needle in, in, some, in some way. Yeah. I want to leave uh, one question for Etienne. We are almost running out of time. I, yes. I have a question actually for Etienne um, about calabashing. Um, and I wondered if, uh, it's a very basic question, are the images stored in any way? Are they, do they remain? Are they fixed? Um, because that would seem to be a huge difference between calabashing and the video camera, and it would really challenge a lot of the things that we were talking about yesterday with the importance of storage and archiving and this kind of obsession with storing everything. And I, I wondered if you could explain that uh, or answer that very basic question and then open up uh, and and give your thoughts on archiving and storage. Oh, okay, thank you. So, I mean, it's not the day that someone came with a tool called the camera that they started working on it. I mean, a lot of these things come from years back and you get to a point where you're presenting something that's finished. And that's why we're working in the realms of the speculative to say, okay, what if this thing that had been toyed with for centuries had been further developed? Um, so I'm not saying that they had gotten to a point where they were moving around hard drives to be able to play it somewhere, you know, but I, I want to believe that what at, at any point in time that they wanted to replay it, they could replay it. What I could not fully understand was the whole process. And because it was not something that was, you know, for me, it's, 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 it was just trying to imagine, because these things do exist. It was trying to imagine to say, okay, what if, because living in the realm of the speculative, if we had decided to go away from this point and say, how could we develop it? I won't believe that if that thought had been in the minds of this for hundreds of years, then there was a possibility that it could have been developed. I think I, I wanted to respond okay. also. Uh, in a matter of storage, I think that uh, most technologies that come from Africa, digital technologies that have got, lasted over centuries, usually is, to think about it, you have to rethink 
your way of how technology is that most technologies we use today, which is very object, like it's an object, your phone has these functions, but most technologies had multifunction. So the calabash, for example, is an instrument. It's not only decorative, it's not only something you eat, it's not only something, it has all of these repurposes, sort of also like print and textile and patterns that are preserved, and also the stories that are told when making certain technologies. So for example, like in beading, um, which is a very digital, t ancient African digital technology, it's not only the making of the patterns, the digital patterns on, that are coded on the beads, it's the conversations and stories that are shared along with them, and then also the purposes and functions of the color coding of the beads. So you have like a skirt that's a certain color printed for a certain function over time that is passed generationally. So that's like a completely different way of understanding storage and also collective memory that has been a contribution that Africa has made. And I think a lot of these like concepts, African concepts have really permeated because of digital and internet culture. And now we are almost like even in our communications with people, sort of telepathic, you can also kind of anticipate when your hot boyfriend's gonna text. Like, and like before that would be seen as kind of like crazy, but we have this really very nuanced and sensitive, very intimate relationship with devices. And then all of these components from the devices come from Africa. So there's like these really hardware, software, cultural, like relational um, networks of systems that contribute to the culture of technologies and our ideas and imagining of daily life, the past and the future. So that's why I think thinking about these ideas from the continent is always so interesting because there's not so much of romanticization and a fetishization of the past and objects that seems to like occur in a lot of other spaces, yeah. Yeah, uh, it's just gone past 10.30 and I would like to uh, thank everybody and to thank my guests for such a wonderful conversation.